Order. Good morning. I want to welcome our witnesses, Secretary Austin and General Brown. Uh, we appreciate you being with us here today. General Brown, this is your first appearance before this subcommittee in your position today, and I want to thank you for your commitment and longstanding service to our nation. Secretary Austin, last year when you testified for this committee, we discussed the danger of a potential government default. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed, and we were able to come together with a bipartisan matter to avert a catastrophic government default and shutdown. But we have failed miserably in getting the budget done on time. Here we are, more than halfway through the fiscal year, and you just got your budget, albeit six months late. These repeated delays and, re and have real impact, and I hope you'll illustrate for us the impact of these late budgets and constant continuing resolutions. We are meeting today to discuss DOD's $833.5 billion budget request for the next fiscal year. This is a 1% increase above last year's budget, and it is consistent with the budget caps that were agreed to in the Bipartisan Fiscal Responsibility Act. On a side note, I will tell you this, Mr. Secretary. The ranking member Collins and myself think we need a bigger number. And that reason for that, and you know this better than I, is because if we're going to invest in future technologies, this number has to be bigger. Uh, the military services and the combatant commands are telling us they have unfunded requirements in excess of $20 billion. The price of fuel is much higher. Our military is engaged in operations around the world. The National Security Supplemental that Congress cleared just last month, some eight months after the administration presented it, uh, addresses some of those concerns. It includes important funds to support Ukraine's continued fight against Russians, buys new weapons for our military services through police those we have given to the Ukrainians, supports Israel's air defense capability, and provides much needed infusion of cash to pay for operations in the Red Sea, and invests in capabilities critical to deter China. Finally, passing the National Security Supplemental was an important step forward, but that alone will not help you or us get the job done. Because of the bipartisan budget caps in our FY25 budget, request is roughly $10 billion below what you had planned for last year at this time, uh, we need to understand what risks this lower budget creates for our military personnel, our operations around the globe, and our modernization efforts. We've got to get a budget done so that the men and women in uniform, supported by the civilians at the Department of Defense, can go about their business of keeping America safe. I support the ongoing efforts of Senator Murray and Collins to chart a path forward that will work and we'll work with anyone to get this job done. Once again, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you for your testimony. But before you begin your opening remarks, I want to recognize Susan Collins, Senator Collins, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Tester, for holding this very important hearing. General Brown, as this is your first time testifying before the subcommittee in your capacity of as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, let me join the chairman in extending a special welcome to you. I also want to thank both of our witnesses as well as the comptroller for your service and the service of the men and women you represent. I look forward to hearing from you how the President's fiscal year 2025 budget requests will affect the Department's implementation of the 2022 National Defense Security Strategy, the goals of which I largely support. We must be clear-eyed that this budget request would represent a real cut in funding for the Department of Defense as it fails to keep pace with inflation. It proposes a defense funding increase of just 1%, $8.6 billion, relative to the current fiscal year. That amount is well short of the $22.5 billion year-over-year -year increase that the department would need simply to cover projected cost escalations related to fuel, 
military and civilian pay, and medical care. This is a nearly $14 billion shortfall. It means that the President's request shifts funding away from modernization, readiness, and procurement to cover these must-pay costs. If the world were becoming safer, then perhaps such a reduction could be absorbed with little risk to national security. But unfortunately, that is not the world in which we live. Russian President Putin continues his brutal bar bomb bar bombardment in Ukraine. Hamas refuses to return the remaining 133 hostages, including five Americans who have been held for 214 days since Hamas's attack on Israel. Iran and its proxies continue to fan the flames of violence throughout the Middle East. And China's military budget and navy continue to grow, including a 7.2% increase in defense spending in the Chinese budget compared to last year. In the past few months, two of our combatant commanders have told me that the threats we face today are the most dangerous than any that they have seen in any time during their careers. In addition, we see a resurgence of ISIS-K and other terrorist groups that have caused the FBI directors to say that it is blinking red in terms of a potential terrorist attack on us or our Western allies. Indeed, we've seen terrorist attacks. The proposed inventory divestments and cuts to ship, vehicle, and aircraft procurement included in the President's budget request would require us to incur excessive risk without there being any discernible reduction in the threats facing our country. The budget request would result in the smallest Air Force fleet in the service's history. We would have the smallest army since the start of the all-volunteer for force in 1973. Our naval fleet of 290 ships is already smaller than China's fleet of more than 370 ships. Under this budget, the Navy's overall fleet would grow by just one ship, a single ship, during the next five years, far fewer than the 435 ships China will have. The technological ed and high-end capabilities that we've enjoyed since the end of the Cold War is also eroding. It's being directly challenged by China and Russia. On a more positive note, I want to commend you, Mr. Secretary, and your teams for efforts to make the department more innovative and in taking steps to strengthen the industrial base. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not use this opportunity to thank Chairman Tester and Chair Murray for working with Leader McConnell and me over the last several months, indeed this entire subcommittee, to get the National Security Supplemental across the finish line. These investments will help to strengthen our own military and defense industrial base while supporting key partners abroad. From the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Southern Maine to the Defense Finance Accounting Service Facility in Northern Maine along our Canadian border and many places in between, Thousands of Mainers proudly support and contribute to our nation's defense. Employees at Bath Ironworks, which builds naval destroyers, and Pratt & Whitney, which manufactures military jet engines, perform essential roles in support of our national security. All of the men and women who serve our country, whether in uniform or in the defense industrial base or as a civilian federal employee, deserve a budget that supports them. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses today. Thank you, Senator Collins.
Uh, first up, we'll have Secretary Austin. Appreciate you being here, Mr. Secretary. You have the floor. Uh, Chairman Tester, uh, Ranking Member Collins, uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify in support of President Biden's proposed fiscal year 2025 budget for the Department of Defense. I'm pleased to be joined by our outstanding Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, and by Undersecretary Mike McCord, the Department's Comptroller. Let me start by thanking this committee for all that you do to support the U.S. military, our troops, and our military families. As Secretary, I've always been guided by three priorities, defending our nation, taking care of our people, and succeeding through teamwork. Our budget request for fiscal year 2025 will advance all three of these priorities. First, the President's request will invest in cutting-edge capabilities across all domains. That includes $48.1 billion for naval and shipbuilding capabilities, $61.2 billion to reinforce U.S. air dominance, and $13 billion to bolster Army and Marine Corps combat capabilities. Our request will also provide $33.7 billion to strengthen our space architecture and $14.5 billion to develop and field advanced cybersecurity tools. It will direct $49.2 billion to modernize and recapitalize all three legs of our nuclear triad. And it will sharpen our tech edge through a $167.5 billion investment in procurement and $143.2 billion in R&D. Second, this budget request will support our outstanding troops and their families. That includes raising base pay and housing allowances, investing in better housing, and making child care more affordable, and funding vital work to prevent sexual assault and suicide in the military. And third, this request will help the department further deepen our teamwork worldwide. Our network of allies and partners remains a strategic advantage that no competitor can match. And you can see its power in our strengthening ties across the Indo-Pacific, and in today's expanded and united NATO, and in the 50-country Ukraine defense contact group that I convene. Our budget remains rooted in our 2022 national defense strategy. Our request positions the United States to tackle the department's pacing challenge, the People's Republic of China, with confidence and urgency. It will help meet the acute threat of Putin's increasingly aggressive Russia. It will help us tackle the persistent dangers from Iran and its proxies. It will help us take on the threats from North Korea and global terrorist organizations and other malign actors. And it will help us continue to deter aggression against the United States and our allies and partners and to prevail in, com in combat uh, if necessary. Now today, I want to underscore three key messages. First, even as our budget request abides by the mandatory caps set by the Fiscal Responsibility Act, it is aligned to our strategy. We made tough but responsible decisions that prioritize near-term readiness, modernization of the joint force, and support for our troops and their families. Our approach dials back some near-term modernization for programs not set to come online until the 2030s. Second, we can only fully reach the goals of our strategy with your help. And I'm grateful that Congress passed the fiscal year 2024 appropriations in March. And the single greatest way that Congress can support the department is to pass predictable, sustained, and timely appropriations. My third and final message is that the price of U.S. leadership is real, but it is far lower than the price of U.S. abdication. As the President has said, we're in a global struggle between democracy and autocracy. And our security relies, relies on American strength of purpose. Our government supports for Israel's genocide, sir. Israel is committing war crimes against Jewish people. Israel is committing war crimes repeatedly and in violation of U.S. law. He has now invaded Rafa, sir. Will your legacy be a live stream genocide, sir? Will your legacy be a live stream? 
You may proceed. And our security relies on American strength of purpose, and that's why our budget request seeks to invest in American security and in America's defense industrial base. The same is true for the recently passed National Security Supplemental that will support our partners in Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan and make key investments to increase submarine production. In fact, about $50 billion of this supplemental will flow through our defense industrial base, creating good jobs in more than 30 states. So we're grateful for our partners in Congress who help us make the investments needed to strengthen America's security through both the supplemental and the President's budget requests. The United States military is the most lethal fighting force on Earth, and with your help, we're going to keep it that way. I deeply appreciate your support for our mission and our troops, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chairman. Secretary Austin, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll have uh, General Brown. General Brown, you have the floor. Uh, Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Collins, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to join Secretary Austin and the Honorable Mike McCord to appear before you today. On behalf of the Joint Force, Department of Defense civilians, and our families, I want to thank Congress for your steadfast support and the opportunity to testify on the fiscal year 2025 defense budget request, which reflects our shared commitment to national security. I also want to thank you for passing the National Security Supplemental, which provides vital support to our allies, partners, and our defense industrial base to counter aggression and strengthen our joint force capabilities and capacity in preparation for any future contingency. The global security environment is increasingly complex. The 2022 National Defense Strategy identifies five key challenges. The People's Republic of China, our pacing challenge, continue its risky behavior around the globe. A newly aggressive Russia with its unprovoked war against Ukraine. A reckless Iran, who we saw a few weeks ago, attempts to escalate regional conflict with unprecedented attacks and support of proxy forces a destabilizing North Korea, which threatens regional security, and violent extremist organizations, which leverage instability to advance their cause. These challenges are interconnected, which demands a strategic approach addressing the immediate threats while also preparing for future contingencies. It requires all of us to operate with a sense of urgency. Days after becoming the chairman, I laid out three expectations in my message to the Joint Force. Honing our warfighting skills has primacy in all we do, modernizing and aggressively leading with new approaches, new concepts and approaches, and trust is the foundation of our profession. Our military exists to fight and win our nation's wars. We train every day to ensure we are so good at what we do that we deter any adversary from engaging U.S. in conflict. This budget requests $147 billion to sustain readiness and ensure the Department can counter near-term threats. We are also focused on better integrating our allies and partners in our planning and operations by investing in critical programs and capability, expanding security cooperation, exercises, training, and interoperability. Our investments of readiness ensure the Joint Force can respond when the nation calls. While we are focused on our readiness for today, it is critical to modernize and lead with new concepts to prepare for tomorrow. The Department continues to invest in capability and capacity to outpace our competitors while transforming from costly legacy platforms that are no longer relevant to the threat. This budget strategically invests $167.5 billion in procurement, underscoring our commitment to equip the Joint Force with unparalleled combat capabilities across every domain. This budget also invests $143.2 billion in research, development, tests, and evaluation of future capabilities that will retain our strategic edge. Find this budget invests significantly into nuclear modernization, digital innovation, multi-year procurement of critical munitions, and the strengthened defense industrial base. With rapidly evolving threats and technologies, accelerating our modernization is crucial. Lastly, trust is the foundation of our profession. The Joint Force must uphold must build upon and uphold the trust in each other, trust of our families, trust of our elected leaders, and trust of our nation. Enhancing the quality of service and the quality of life of our personnel is not just a moral obligation, it's a strategic imperative. The budget includes investments in quality of service efforts, such as advanced training, educational benefits, and career development, 
while also investing in quality of life projects like housing, medical clinics, and childcare facilities, as well as funding spouse employment initiatives, enhanced mental health resources, and robust, robust programs to combat sexual assault. We must create an environment where all can reach their full potential. Trust that our joint force stands ready, ready to defend our national interests, ready to deter aggression, and ready, if necessary, to fight and win our nation's wars. I thank you for your support and collaboration in our shared commitment to face the security challenges of today and prepare for tomorrow. We're living in consequential times, and there's no time to waste. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your statement, uh, General Brown, and there will be uh, probably uh, multiple rounds, but there will be five minutes per member. Um, this is for you, Secretary Austin. The budget request is consistent with the cap set forth in the Federal F Fiscal Responsibility Act. However, the proposed growth is below current inflation levels. It does not account for billions of dollars for additional requirements in identified uh, by the military services. Um, as has been pointed out by both of you, this is a very dangerous time in which we live. Uh, in my lifetime, probably comparable to the early 60s with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, where are you taking risks because of this budget cap? I should say, where are we taking risks because of this budget cap? Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, our budget uh, continues to be strategy driven. Over the last several years, uh, we've worked hard to make sure that we, we link the budget requests uh, to the strategy, and uh, and that's been, uh, uh, in my view, uh, the uh, the best approach to uh, uh, to constructing the budget. Uh, but to meet the caps uh, approved by Congress, uh, the uh, we, we had to make some tough but responsible choices, uh, and uh, we prioritized uh, near-term readiness. Uh, as you heard me say earlier, Chairman, we we decided not to invest in some. Uh, uh, modernization that would not, would not deliver uh, results before 2030. Uh, and we uh, invested in, uh, in our, our people and our, our families. Um, the kinds of this, uh, uh, decisions that we had to make were uh, tough decisions that we had to make were, were things like fifth and sixth generation uh, aircraft. Uh, but having said that, um, our budget does include, as you heard uh, me say earlier, uh, 143.2 billion dollars for RDT and E, uh, and 167.5 billion dollars for procurement. Uh, and because uh, we accepted uh, some risk in uh, in modernization for the out years, we'll need to uh, have a, a growth in the top line uh, in the out years to ensure that uh, that we can recapture. Uh, some of the things that uh, we weren't able to, to get into this budget. So let me follow up on that. Uh, you talked about you're going to focus on the projects that can give you results before 2030. Um, so that means basically with this budget what we're doing is we're putting off expenditures into future budget cycles because these projects after 2030 are projects that will have to be taken care of f fiscally, correct? Uh, that, that's correct, Chairman. And our, our plan is to, uh, going forward, invest in those things, but, uh, but uh, we weren't able to do it in, in this budget. We, we've prioritized near-term readiness uh, and, uh, and taking care of our people, uh, and, uh, and I, we, I believe that's the right approach. Do you believe that in future budgets, if we're able to invest uh, in those projects, that we will be able to catch up and remain on schedule? I do, uh, Chairman, provided... Uh, if if we are uh, provided the the resources and uh, and the uh, the growth in the top line in the out years that uh, that we'll ask for, okay, General Brown, um, you talked about where we are today. Um, is there operational impacts from this budget today, over the next year, um, and what impact does this have, say, five years down the road? Or do you, for operational impacts for today, because we, because of our focus on readiness, uh, I don't see uh, operational impacts. Now, uh, as the secretary highlighted, is we uh, had to defer some of our modernization. You think about five, six, you know, years, a, a decade from now, um, there's potential challenges if we don't get the additional support in, in uh, uh, top line in uh, in the out years. 
Excuse me, what kind of challenges are we talking about when you say additional challenges? Well, you know, part of it uh, was the uh, deferring some of our modernization and uh, ensure, you know, the thing I focus on as a chairman is ensure we have both uh, capability and capacity. And we've got to make sure we have capability that uh, uh, is, stays ahead of the threat and then also have capacity to uh, be able to operate uh, in many of the uh, areas around the world like we, like we do today. And that's where we need to make sure we're working uh, closely together on, uh, on the out years to ensure that we can actually uh, continue to modernize and make sure we stay ahead of the threat. Okay. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, let me follow up on the Chairman's question by asking you a very basic question, and that is, if you had your preference, would you be operating under a 1% increase? In other words, do you think that Congress should revisit the 1% cap that is imposed by the Fiscal Responsibility Act? Certainly, the, the uh the cap makes it more challenging and forces us to make choices that uh, that uh, if we didn't have that cap, we obviously wouldn't have to make. So, um, yes, it, it does uh, provide uh, uh, provide more challenges. But certainly, we have worked hard to to link our request to our strategy, and, and as much of our strategy as we can, as we can support, we're going to support. Thank you. I want to switch to a different issue. On October 25th, 2023, that was the darkest day in Maine history in my lifetime. 18 Mainers lost their lives, 13 others were injured in the worst mass shooting that we have seen. The killer, Robert Card, was a Sergeant First Class in the U.S. Army Reserve. The governor of Maine established an independent commission that has issued an interim report. And that report included several very troubling findings about missed opportunities to prevent this tragedy. For instance, mental health providers recommended to Mr. Card's Army Reserve Unit that, quote, measures be taken to safely remove all firearms and weapons from his home. Well, the Army Reserve Unit took appropriate action to reserve Mr. Card's access to military weapons. This recommendation was never communicated by the Army to relevant law enforcement agencies in Maine. We had members of Mr. Card's unit raising alarms with their supervisors about, what, about their fear that he was extremely dangerous. He actually assaulted a fellow soldier. He was institutionalized for two weeks at a, at a hospital um, for those with mental illness in New York State while he was on drill. We have an Inspector General's report that is underway to look at this more thoroughly. After I receive that report, I intend to draft legislation that would require our military services to report to the appropriate authorities when someone, when a service member poses a threat to him or herself or to others while protecting the Second Amendment rights of our service members. Would you commit to working with me on such legislation to establish formal policies and procedures so that we can ensure that our military services share this kind of relevant information with law enforcement and with state officials under the appropriate state laws? Um, thanks, Senator. Well, first of all, um, this was a tragedy, and my thoughts and prayers uh, go out to all those affected by, by, by this tragedy. Um, the health and, and welfare of our troops is uh, real, uh, very important to me at the top of my mind all the time. So is the health and welfare of our community members. 
Uh, and so, um, absolutely, we will we will work with you to uh, uh, to ensure that uh, we have the mechanisms to, uh, where appropriate, pass uh, uh, relevant information to authorities. And, and uh, uh, so, I look forward to our uh, my staff uh, engaging your staff on this issue and, and going forward. Thank you very much. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome, Mr. Secretary, General Brown, um, and Mr. McCord. Secretary Austin, while I'm glad that um, we were able to pass the National Security Supplemental, I think all of us um, were relieved that that happened. Um, what we've seen is that Russia's industrial base has been able to increase production um, in part due to sanctions evasions, um, in part because they're getting assistance now from the People's Republic of China, from Iran, from North Korea. Um, so, and we know that Iran now supplies 70 percent of Russia's drone capabilities in Ukraine. Those are the same drones that they're using the, in the Middle East to um, kill American service members and attack us. So, can you talk a little bit about how the administration is seeking to limit industrial-based cooperation between Russia and China, and what in this budget will help us do that? Well, we certainly have, have raised this issue in, in the right channels, uh, uh, Senator, and, and, uh, and you are right. Uh, prior to, uh, at one point, Russia had experienced significant losses uh, because of the work uh, that Ukraine uh, and its forces was doing. Uh, they had inflicted significant casualties on the Russian forces, uh, destroyed uh, a significant amount of its equipment. And so, to your point, uh, we, saw, we saw Russia uh, engage North Korea, uh, who provided uh, quite a bit of munitions and, uh, and, and, and missiles. Uh, the drones provided by uh, Iran uh, really kind of helped begin to turn the tide there for Russia a bit and, ha and allow them to kind of get back up on their feet. In addition to them uh, increasing their, their uh, uh, production in their industrial base. Uh, but w without the help from uh, Iran, North Korea, and China, to your point, uh, this probably would not have occurred to the degree that it has occurred. Uh, so we have engaged uh, in, the, in the right channels to uh, uh, emphasize uh, our, our serious concerns about uh, uh, PRC and, and, and others providing this sort of support. Uh, as you know, uh, there are sanctions that, uh, that we continue to look at in a number of areas, uh, and, uh, and we revisit those sanctions to ensure that uh, they're be we're being as effective as we can. But that continues to be a work in progress, and and it, and so this is a whole of government effort, and uh, and uh, again, uh, I think we're engaging in, in the right in the right channels, but there's a lot more work that uh, continues to uh, need to be done. So. Well, thank you. Clearly, we still have work to do. Um, Secretary Austin, the last time I saw you before the Armed Services Committee, we talked about um, the 60 Minutes report about anomalous health incidents, and you committed to um, taking a look again at um, the genesis of those incidents. But one of the other aspects of that are the the personnel who have been affected by those anomalous health incidents. And in DOD, the, appropriate, uh, the fiscal year appropriations bill for DOD in 2024 provided funding specific for um, payments to victims of anomalous health incidents. And there is funding in 2025 to provide payments as well. But the rulemaking um, that is required to get those payments out the door has not yet happened. Will you commit to this committee that uh, the department will work on that and provide the required payments to victims? Absolutely, uh, Senator. And do you know when DOD plans to publish its final regulations around this issue? Uh, I, I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't have a, a forecast. No. Um, if you could get back to the committee, I would appreciate that. Um, I know that we have a number of people who are um, waiting for help who have been affected. Um, General Brown, 
This budget invests in important conventional capabilities, but one of the areas where we still have challenges is in the area of disinformation and misinformation. So can you talk about how the budget invests in our capabilities for cyber and in the information domain to counter what we're seeing um, from virtually all of our adversaries? Well, you know, there's uh, areas that we're investing in uh, uh, in the information domain. In, in particular, uh, uh, there's about $14.5 billion in our, our cyber capabilities for both offensive and defensive cyber. There's about uh, $1.8 billion for artificial intelligence to better understand how we would use that. But I think it's also important that we understand how our adversaries would use artificial uh, intelligence against us. Um, and it's really, uh, again, how we bring together our, our data and using our data and having good under way, ways to uh, analyze, particularly the misinformation, uh, and ensuring that we stay ahead in the uh, particular cyber realm to get information out and get the, the facts out early. And, and part of this is not only the investment in the technology, but it's also the investment in the training of our, our, of our force uh, to, to move at the pace of uh, the way information moves today. Um, that's something we'll continue to work on as well. Well, thank you. My time is up, but I hope we're also working with the Global Engagement Center at the Department of State because clearly this is uh, an area where we have an equal amount of work to do. Thank you. Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your presence and service. Um, the administration has halted a shipment of American-made munitions to Israel. Even if it's the administration's goal to reach a ceasefire agreement, does this not send the wrong message to our ally Israel and embolden Iran and Iranian-backed groups? We should not be signaling to Iran's enemies that our support is conditional. Uh, many of us in this room worked hard to get aid uh, included and passed by the House and Senate in the emergency supplemental. Uh, my questions uh, on this topic are three. Should we be concerned that the aid that was included in that recent supplemental is in jeopardy of being withheld from Israel? Did the Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken, consult with you on this decision? And do you agree that that halting U.S. assistance to Israel emboldens its enemies? Thanks, Senator. First of all, our, our commitment to uh, Israel's security is ironclad, as you had seen from the very beginning. Uh, we have flowed uh, uh, billions of dollars of security assistance at a uh, very rapid pace uh, into, into Israel. Uh, and as you just mentioned, uh, with your help, and we're grateful for this, uh, you just passed uh, the largest ever supplemental appropriation. Um, and most recently, in uh, on April 13th and 14th, you saw us lead a, a uh, uh, an unprecedented coalition to to defend Israel as uh, Iran attacked Israel with uh, a significant number of uh, drones and and, uh, and ballistic missiles. Uh, and so we're going to continue to do what's necessary to ensure that Israel has the means to defend itself. Uh, but that said, uh, we are currently reviewing some near-term uh, security assistance shipments. Uh, in the context of unfolding events uh, uh, in Rafah. Uh, so you agree with the pause, and I mean, you were consulted and agree with the pause, Mr. Secretary? Uh, I, again, I, I think uh, we haven't made any decisions. We, uh, we did uh, pause as we uh, reevaluated uh, uh, some of the security assistance that we're providing uh, to... So, stop the clock so that Jerry gets his full two and a half minutes. So, so we, we've been very clear, Senator, <laughs> as you know, from the very beginning that, um, that Israel shouldn't launch a, a major attack in Arafa without accounting for uh, and protecting the civilians that are in that battle space. Uh, and, and again, as we have uh, assessed the situation, uh, we paused one shipment of high... high uh, uh, payload uh, munitions, um, and uh, and again, I, I think we've also been very clear about uh, the steps that we'd like to see uh, uh, Israel take to, to account for and take care of those civilians before 
uh, major combat uh, takes place. We certainly would like to see uh, no major combat take place in Rafah, but, uh, but certainly our focus is on making sure that we protect the civilians. And we've, again, we've not made a final determination uh, on how to proceed with, uh, uh, with that shipment. Uh, and I would highlight that uh, this, uh, this shipment doesn't have anything to do with the supplemental appropriations that, uh, that you just uh, helped, us, helped us get. And, and my final comment is that we are absolutely committed to uh, uh, continuing to support Israel in its, uh, in its right to defend itself. Mr. Secretary, thank you. I worry about the suggestion that uh, support by the United States is conditional. Let me turn to a different topic. Uh, legislative Proposal 480, the Space Guard uh, issue about uh, the National Guard, the code dictates that National Guard equities cannot be withdrawn without the consent of a state's governor. I am informed that recently governors from 53 states and territories wrote you a letter opposing this legislative proposal. Uh, would you uh, tell me what uh, the department's uh, thoughts are? Um, do you consult with governors? And based upon this overwhelming feedback, does it uh, cause any reconsideration about the legislative proposal? I have received a letter from, uh, from the governor, Senator, and uh, most recently, the uh, Secretary of the Air Force has, uh, has reached out and engaged uh, the governors to, to talk about this issue and explain uh, the rationale. Uh, as you know, when we stood up uh, Space Force, uh, we, uh, we took on uh, units and people that were focused on the space mission uh, and incorporated those from, from the Air Force, from the, from the Army, from the Navy, and incorporated those people and units into the Space Force. Uh, this, uh, this measure will affect, uh, I believe, a small number of people. Uh, but certainly, you know, I understand the governor's concerns, and we owe it to the governors uh, to engage them on it. And that's why uh, Secretary of the Air Force has recently engaged them personally on this issue. So. I encourage that to occur. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Chairman of the Full Appropriations Committee, Senator Murray. Thank you very much, Chair Tester, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. Right now, we face a number of serious challenges across the globe. That's why Vice Chair Collins and I pushed through the gridlock to hammer out and pass a strong national security package that sent support to our allies, especially Ukraine, humanitarian aid to civilians, and a message to our allies and adversaries alike that America is still strong enough and united enough to lead the free world. We didn't just pass a bill, we passed a critical test on the world stage. And something I don't want anyone to forget, the bill the House eventually passed was essentially identical to the one the Senate passed two months earlier. However, the delay in inaction was not without cost. We and our allies lost precious time and resources during those two months that we can't recover. This is similar to the costs we face each time we flirt with a government shutdown or put the government on autopilot under continuing resolutions. Those situations come with costs, and notably, neither China nor Russia face the threat of a government shutdown or a CR. I'm certain all of us agree that democracies are stronger than dictatorships, but we have got to prove it, and that will take bipartisanship. Because as we all know, our work is not done. We must maintain America's leadership and make smart investments to help reduce global conflict and instability, which of course keeps our country safe. That means ensuring our military remains the best in the world, supporting the men and women in uniform who sacrifice greatly to keep our country safe, having our allies' backs, and taking an all-of-a-government approach to keep our country strong and secure. We are working with tight fiscal constraints, but Secretary Austin, it is so important we make sure not only that your department has the resources needed to execute our national defense strategy, but that, our, that your counterparts across government also have the resources they need to keep our country safe. The 1% increase in funding provided for FY25 under the CAPS is as inadequate for non-defense spending as it is for the Department of Defense. Having just worked together to write and pass 12 bipartisan bills for FY24, we all know this very clearly. So as members talk about how we might increase investments to better meet our defense needs, we cannot ignore our needs here at home as well. 
When it comes to additional resources above the caps, which the Vice Chair and others have mentioned, I am going to insist on parity for non-defense spending to make sure we are providing for our children and families, keeping them safe. After all, our safety also depends on our diplomatic corps, which works around the clock to prevent and end conflict. Our counterterrorism efforts and the law enforcement personnel working to identify and disrupt threats, our public health system and pandemic response efforts, the officials enforcing our sanctions to help choke off financial resources for dictators like Putin, our work countering the influence of the Chinese Communist Party, ensuring we remain on the cutting edge of research and manufacturing, and so much more. So with that in mind, Secretary Austin, can you talk about your work with your counterparts across government, whether that is at State or Commerce or so many other agencies, and how their efforts assist the work you do to keep our country safe and factor into our national defense strategy? You have heard a, a number of secretaries say before, Chair Murray, that uh, if, if we don't fund uh, State and others to the right level, then we are going to need more bullets, because they do great uh, and important work uh, to, uh, uh, to move things uh, towards uh, greater stability and security uh, in all regions of, uh, of the world. Uh, and so it is this whole of government effort, this, this interaction uh, between uh, uh, departments in support of our overall goals and objectives that, uh, that really is what causes us to be effective. So. Uh, it, it's important that they do get uh, they they do get supported. So. Thank you. And as the chair of our committee knows, that includes our veterans and the challenges that they're having right now with the VA budget. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on the sixty billion dollars that Congress appropriated to support Ukraine in its fight against Putin, a package this committee worked on for months. As this war continues now into its third year, how is this funding being used? What improvements are we seeing on the front line? Well, it's still uh, very early on. Um, as you know, it d does take time to get some of this capability in. Uh, but we, uh, in anticipation of the potential of getting the supplemental approved, uh, we uh, forward position some things, some critical things like uh, air defense interceptors and, uh, and artillery munitions so that if it were approved, we would be able to rapidly uh, move those things in in support of Ukraine. And we are doing that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I talk to my counterpart uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, every week. I just talked to him yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, in checking on uh, how, the, how that's going, what his most critical needs are. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think, again, this is going to be very, very helpful. But to your point, uh, uh, it, it's hard to buy back time. And, and, but given that, uh, I think that Without this help, uh, Ukraine would be it would have a very tough time uh, defending against uh, what is a superior force uh, in, with the Russians. So. And is our inventory here at home being replenished? Uh, it will certainly this supplemental will certainly uh, help help in a major way in that regard. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, that um, we we do have the ability to replenish our, our stocks. Uh, and as we have drawn down some of our stocks and provided. Uh, uh, weapons and uh, and vehicles to Ukraine. We'll replace those weapons with newer models, uh, and uh, and all of that work flows through uh, our industrial base, and it'll affect some 30 uh, different states uh, in the country, mm -hmm. and that creates good jobs, uh, good uh, good paying jobs for for Americans, and and we remain excited about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Bozeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chair Collins for this important hearing. Uh, Secretary Austin and General Brown, thank you both for your service. I appreciate your leadership and unwavering commitment to our, to our service members and very importantly to their families. Uh, Secretary Austin, the National Defense Strategy underscores the need to prioritize interoperability and enable coalitions with enhanced capabilities. I remain dedicated to working with the Air Force to ensure Ebbing Air National Guard Base in Fort Smith, Arkansas, becomes the premier F-35 pilot training center in the future. It is important that this mission begins on time and with the necessary resources. 
Secretary, or Secretary Austin, can you speak to how this mission will strengthen warfighting capabilities and create an enduring advantage with our allies and partners? Well, it, it, uh, it, this is a, it, this clearly uh, provides a capability to, for us to enhance our interoperability, uh, Senator, and uh, it, it's a great, uh, great platform, great capability. Uh, the training is always uh, uh, first rate uh, because of the commitment of our, our trainers. And uh, um, again, there are a lot of countries who want this capability. And, uh, and having the, the, the ability to, to train to standard uh, in, uh, in country uh, is, uh, is absolutely uh, uh, important. And so um, it contributes to the, uh, the overall readiness of the, uh, of the combined force. So okay. um, you can, uh, you know, interoperability means having the right, the same, the right policies and procedures, but it also means uh, the ability to work with together with uh, with our comrades in other countries, right. and so this uh, this face to face uh, um, uh, work that uh, is conducted at places like this, I think, is critical. So. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. General Brown, you and I recently visited Camden, Arkansas, where we toured a munitions production facility and saw the urgent need for our defense industrial base to increase capacity and replenish our stockpiles. The passage of the $95 billion security supplemental bill proves that when we provide assistance to our allies and partners, we strengthen our defense industrial base as well. This fiscal year, Congress also approved multi-year procurement for six missile programs for the first time. General Brown, what impact will multi-year procurement authority have on the defense industrial base and specifically munitions production? Well, when I think about multi-year procurement, uh, what it does is provides uh, uh, opportunity for consistency. And that consistency is a, uh, for us to be able to provide a, uh, a consistent demand signal to an industry so they can actually uh, get a workforce, have a supply chain, and, uh, and, and know what to uh, forecast for over several years. Um, uh, I think that's going to help us in the long run because that consistency will help build trust it will drive down costs and it will in, uh, uh, ensure we get uh, capability delivered on time. Okay. If we have inconsistency, it's going to you know, in, uh, decrease that trust, increase the cost, and then also increase how long it's going to take to get the capability in the hands of our warfighters. So uh, the multi-year procurement, the national security supplemental that will invest in our defense industrial base is, uh, is hugely important, not only for our allies and partners, but it's just as important for, for our force as well. Good. And I appreciate you getting out and about. I know you're traveling a lot, you know, visiting these places. And uh, again, I, I think that's really important and very well received. Secretary Austin, I appreciate your continued focus in taking care of people. The budget calls for a 4.5% pay increase for service members and annual increases to housing and uh, subsistence allowances. The quadrennial review of military compensation is due to be completed by January 2025. In the meantime, there have also been multiple recommendations to enhance pay flexibility for service members, including incentive pay for certain career fields and targeted raises for junior enlisted service members. Secretary Austin, in your opinion, where would pay flexibility be most effective if implemented? Well, first of all, let me let me thank you for the support that you've given us uh, to date. As you pointed out, uh, we're asking you for a 4.5% pay raise in, in this budget request, uh, Senator. But to take you back a bit, uh, in 23, we asked you for a 4.6% 4, 4 pay raise. Uh, you supported us on that. And in the uh, fiscal year 24 budget, we asked you for a 5.2% pay raise. And that's the largest pay raise in 20 years. And so when you add those uh, uh, together, I think uh, uh, that, that's, that's a pretty meaningful uh, increase in, uh, in compensation. Um, my goal is to, is to provide, uh, reduce the costs on, on troops and families and provide more resources. Uh, and so anything that we do in terms of um, these types of actions, to answer your question, 
uh, does uh, reduce uh, the strain on, on our troops and families. Uh, whether or not uh, you know, we, we can do that going forward, uh, well, certainly uh, any recommendation that's, being, uh, that's made, we'll have to do an analysis in terms of how it affects uh, you know, the budget now and into the future. And, and so as you uh, propose uh, different things, uh, we, we certainly look to work with you and, and provide you that analysis. So. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. Senator Schatz. Thank you, uh, Chair, Vice Chair. <clears throat> Secretary, uh, thanks for being here. I want to talk to you about the Red Hill closure and remediation. Um, once the decision was taken to uh, shut down Red Hill, that part went um, relatively smoothly um, and was uh, ahead of schedule. And then there's the, the whole enterprise of the new concept of operations as it relates to fuel in the Pacific. I'm going to set that aside uh, for the moment because the, um, <clears throat> the thing that the community is working on and thinking about um, the most is uh, long-term health impacts and long-term environmental impacts. And um, what of the appropriated money that we provided to the department is allocated for that. Now we just got a brief and so we have some broad categories for um, what I think is called community response. Um, but I'd love it if you could just articulate both at the conceptual level and, as, and, and in as granular a ma uh, manner as you can, um, what you're planning to do with the remainder of the money as it relates to uh, <clears throat> making sure that none of that petroleum eventually makes its way back into any of those aquifers and that anyone who's been harmed by ingesting petroleum product um, gets taken care of by the department. Well, thanks, Senator Schatz. As you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, once uh, the defueling was complete, you know, then we, we stood down uh, the Red Hill Task Force and then stood up uh, a task force uh, that the Navy is now in charge of uh, and is, uh, is uh, charged with uh, environmental remediation. And, uh, you know, I've... Uh, I've had uh, personal conversations with uh, both the leader of the task force and, most importantly, the Secretary of the Navy uh, on how important this is, and they are committed uh, to ensuring that, we're, that they do the right things uh, to make sure that, uh, that we uh, get this right going forward. Uh, we owe it to the members of the community to, to ensure that, uh, that we, we, have in, we do, in fact, do this. Uh, in terms of specific amounts of... Uh, of uh, funds that are allocated to uh, to each segment of this, I'll have to take that for the record and, and come back to you on that, sir. That's fine. Um, and you know, we just got briefed uh, on it yesterday, and it's still a bit of like you know, big pots of money categories: 95 million here, 32 million there, five, 62 going to the task force. So we don't even know what these numbers mean. Um, but I think you know, the community is asking me what's happening with the money. It has to be obligated by the end of the this fiscal year, and so. Um, time is short, so if we can get fidelity on that, it doesn't have to be with you, but it can be any member of your team. That would be, that would be very, very. Uh, and, and while we're at it, uh, Senator, with, yes. with your permission, I'd just like to thank you and, and the delegation for, for your continued support. Uh, without that, we probably wouldn't have the the adequate uh, resources to do the things that are going to need to be done going forward here. Thank you, uh, General Brown. Uh, you know the amount of aid that this committee can provide is finite. Um, given that the Indo-Pacific is the priority theater, um, I'm going to say this somewhat less diplomatically than my prepared question. What keeps you up at night? What are the unfunded priorities that you think we really need to take a hard look at in the, in the Indo-Pacific? Well, the, uh, the things that I, I stay focused on, um, and I'll just tell you, uh, I'm very confident in our joint force, so there's not much that keeps me up at night. But I do stay focused on ensuring we have the... Uh, the capability and capacity for our joint force to execute what the nation asks. And so it, it is the, uh, the modernization uh, uh, things that we highlighted earlier in this hearing that we had to defer um, as we, uh, because of the fiscal responsibility. And so I want to make sure that we actually have that cast, uh, capability and capacity to modernize. It's also the multi-year procurement that we uh, also spoke about on munitions. Uh, I also want to have a strong defense industrial base so we can produce those munitions and those capabilities so we don't have a fair fight. I want to have an unfair fight 
where we have the advantage and do that not only with our joint force, but also with our allies and partners. This is a little bit outside of our committee, but a lot of us are on the, the MILCON uh, committee as well. Um, you know, the other thing I'd flag is overseas MILCON is never the most exciting thing for a member of the United States Senate to fund, but it is really essential in the Indo-Pacific uh, theater. And then certainly in the state of Hawaii, a lot of uh, the DOD's um, assets, spaces and installations and everything else are sitting on really, really old infrastructure. So that's the other thing that's less exciting to fund sewer systems, water systems, electrical redundancy and all the rest of it. But we're not capable if we don't have those things operating well. So let's, let's at least elevate it even though, you know, it's not exactly the kind of thing that you do a ribbon cutting for um, uh, if you're a good politician. So thank you. Then all those things cost money and it's another reason we need to revisit the caps. Thank you, Senator Schatz. Thank S you. S Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here and for your great service to our country. Um, Secretary Austin, I'm a little concerned, uh, a very concerned about the credibility of the administration's deterrence policy. Uh, when I see President Biden's messaging to Putin and to Iran and to the Houthis and other Iran-backed groups, I just see President Biden saying, don't. And we've had, you know, attacks, people obviously not adhering to that. I'm concerned that we are significantly eroding our deterrence by setting these sort of ambiguous boundaries and letting our adversaries kind of walk over us sometimes. So what steps do, are you and the president taking to establish a stronger, more critical, credible deterrence against these threats from our adversaries besides just don't? I, I take it you're speaking about the Middle East. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Specifically. So, um, you know, we had a number of goals at the very beginning uh, of, uh, of this crisis, and uh, one of them was to take, protect our people, uh, and uh, both our, our troops and, and civilians uh, in the region. Uh, another was to uh, recover the hostages. Uh, an, another was to ensure that... Uh, we're doing everything that we can to support Israel in its efforts to defend itself. And then finally, it's our goal to uh, ensure that we contain this, this uh, conflict in Gaza and not have a regional conflict break out. Uh, so you saw us early on uh, uh, deploy uh, some pretty substantial uh, capabilities into theater to discourage people from trying to do that, from uh, trying to blow this into a, a regional conflict. And I think uh, even though there's been, there's been dust-ups throughout the region, uh, we don't see a regional conflict uh, uh, at this point, Senator. Um, so if, if you take a look at the attacks that were being conducted against our troops, you recall that in January we saw, leading up to January, we saw a number of attacks that, against our troops and our, our bases. Uh, and you saw us in, in February conduct a pretty major strike in, right. in, uh, that the president authorized in uh, both Iraq and Syria. Uh, since that time, uh, we've seen uh, two incidents, uh, and, uh, and we attribute those uh, actions to probably rogue elements. So in that case, uh, they have been deterred uh, from, from attacking our troops. But in terms of, of uh, Iran and its... Uh, uh, and its actions in the region. Iran continues to present a, a, uh, a threat to the region, uh, and, uh, and that's something that we're going to have to remain focused on, for sure. Uh, let me ask both of you a question here about the reports that uh, w of withholding weapons. We all voted, uh, many of us, I certainly didn't, was pleased to support the bill this, uh, by 79 to 18, um, to um, reinvigorate not just our own defense industrial, but also to give aid to um, several other entities. Um, what is the status of withholding our weaponry that we voted to send to Israel? Are we doing that? Why are we doing that? Uh, again, you know, our, our commitment to uh, Israel is ironclad, uh, Senator. And, and uh, you know, as I, I said earlier, uh, since uh, October 7th, we have flowed in billions of dollars right. worth, of, uh, worth of security assistance. Uh, and uh, as you just mentioned, you just passed the largest right. supplemental uh, in, in, in history for, that's focused on, on Israel. Uh, and we're going to continue to do what's necessary to, uh, to support Israel. Um, Are those reports false then that I'm reading? 
Now, we are currently reviewing some near-term security assistance shipments uh, in the context of the unfolding events uh, in, in Rafa. So, so we are withholding uh, our shipments of weapons predicated on the uh, strategy that Israel's employing and in going into Rafa. Is that the bottom line here? We, we've not, uh, again, we're, we're assessing. Uh, we, we, we have not made uh, any final decisions uh, on this yet, but, uh, but um, to, to answer your question, yes, yes. We, we are, there are some things that we're taking a closer look at. So. Okay, that, that, that's a, an answer that's, uh, well, thank you for clarifying it. I, I, I wouldn't say I agree with it, but thank you for clarifying it. Uh, General Brown, let me ask you, uh, w this is one of the things that's come up on the, uh, the refortification of our own uh, munitions. How do you see that now that we've passed this and the President signed this? Well, I, it, it's going to put us on a, on a much better path. Um, and it's not only what the, the supplemental, but it also say the, uh, the 24, FY24 uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which allowed for multi-year procurement for six systems. I, I wouldn't look to actually expand that in the future on uh, multi-year procurement because what that will do will provide uh, levels of consistency for our defense industrial base so they can actually work the workforce, facilities, supply chains, uh, and allow us to uh, make sure we have the a, a capacity from a munition standpoint. So you're convinced that we're on a glide path to, to renew our munitions supplies uh, to a satisfactory level for, for, well, for you? We're, we're on a good path. And good. One, one of the pieces I'd also add, though, you know, getting a budget on time is actually really important to actually provide that level of consistency so right. we can write contracts um, and uh, gives our, uh, our uh, defense industrial base the confidence and the trust that they can invest and have that workforce and supply chain. I think we all hear you. Thank you. Got it. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Tester, uh, Vice Chair Collins, and thank you uh, to the leadership of this committee, the full committee chair and vice chair, for um, navigating some very challenging dynamics uh, and getting ultimately uh, delivered to our warfighters and uh, to all the different uh, departments and agencies that were um, supported through the supplemental, a critically needed additional funding. As a new member of this subcommittee, I look forward to working with you. Um, I've got two questions I'd like to focus on. As you heard Chair Murray um, in her, I thought, compelling commentary, we need to coordinate between defense, diplomacy, and development to be as effective as possible, particularly in places that are on the margins of the main conflicts currently appropriately occupying most of your time. I chair the subcommittee that funds the State Department and USAID. Five years ago, President Trump signed into law the Global Fragility Act, which Senator Graham and I and two dozen other senators co-sponsored and worked on. And it's a simple proposition. It requires coordination between DOD, USAID, and state in fragile countries that are not yet failed states, not yet scenes of active combat, but where we might implement the same sort of strategy we pursued in Colombia over a long period of time to prevent a fragile state from becoming a failed state. One of my concerns has been the genuine lack of DOD engagement in Global Fragility Act implementation. I understand you have a lot on your plate, um, but there are several identified nations and areas of focus under GFA. One of them happens to now be the subject of, I think, renewed intense engagement, coastal West Africa. I've been to every country in the Sahel. I have visited the relevant air base in Niger that is now being occupied by both Russian and American troops as we are likely uh, being forced to leave Niger. Um, I'm very concerned about the security and stability situation in the region. And our partners, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, with whom we have trained and prepared for quite some time, have been asking now for years for additional security assistance. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd be interested in your input on what DOD's plans are for taking advantage of this existing structure for how we can coordinate planning between the diplomats, the development professionals, and the security professionals of our government and our allied partners in an area that is newly of some focus, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, because of the very real threats of violent extremist organizations, of Wagner, of jihadists in the Sahel threatening these partner nations. How do we plan to use this tool, sir? Uh, I. I I, uh, well, first of all, we, we are fully committed to supporting the, the, uh, uh, the Global Fragility Act. 
Um, and, and you are right, uh, that area that you mentioned is of increased uh, importance. Uh, you mentioned that we were forced to leave Niger. Uh, I, uh, we will leave Niger, Senator, but uh, as you know, uh, what we do in order to, uh, well, terrorism thrives in ungoverned spaces. And what yes. we typically do is to try to uh, help uh, uh, countries develop their own capability to, to uh, control their, their, uh, their sovereign spaces. Uh, but you've got to have a reliable partner. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, we, sir, we could spend a lot of time on yeah. the, on the uh, coups in Mali and Burkina and Niger and how that happened and why. I, I, not to interrupt, I don't mean to be rude. I have very little time, sir. Yeah. I agree with you that we have an unreliable partner in Niger. I visited those facilities. I regret that the significant investment that we made there will not likely um, redound to our benefit. I just was wondering how you see prioritizing partnering with state and AID in developing security plans for coastal West Africa, if I might, sir. Yeah, so what I was gonna say next sir. is that uh, you are right, uh, this is an important area. And we are working with state currently to, uh, uh, to address those places that you mentioned uh, and potentially develop the capability to, uh, uh, to have a presence there and, uh, and, and partner uh, in, in, uh, in, more, in a more significant way with, with a couple of those countries. And that, that work is ongoing now. Well, I look forward to um, consulting uh, with, with you both about this because I think there is an urgency to it from a security perspective. Um, I, I would agree. Chairman, it, this is what keeps me up at night, is a number of very capable uh, foreign terrorist organizations that see this. If I might, Mr. Chairman, ask one last quick question. Damn quick. Damn quick. Um, I've also recently visited um, in Jordan and Iraq, and I'm very concerned about the threat to our forces posed by low, slow, the, exactly the low technology drones that Iran is providing to Russia at, at scale. I see that there is a specific counter UAS fund in this year's budget. Just briefly speak um, to the importance of having flexible funding and our ability to develop and deploy quickly um, state-of-the-art defenses to this evolving threat to our troops. Thank you, sir. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, the Army continues to budget for tactical wheeled vehicles at rates well below the minimum sustaining rates industry requires to keep uh, production lines open. And further, the Army is risking a gap in production by transitioning the joint light tactical vehicle to a company that has no experience manufacturing this platform. So I'm worried that the Army's management of these programs and their associated industrial base, um, and, and um, the Army is due uh, to complete a strategy for the acquisition of these platforms this summer. Uh, but I'm concerned about the Army's ability to grade its own work, frankly. The tactical wheel vehicle sector is an important part of the overall industrial base and our national security strategy. Um, so, Mr. Secretary, can I count on sound decision making from DOD on vehicle programs? And further, will you engage the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Based Policy in reviewing the Army's management of the tactical wheeled vehicles and providing recommendations? Uh, you, you can. I, I will. Um, and. Uh that there's no question that uh, Wisconsin's industrial base is critical, and uh, and so uh, we want to make sure that we continue to do the right things and keep uh, and, and make sure we have the capacity to address our needs going forward. So, uh. Okay, um, uh, Wisconsin's industrial base is something, of course, that's always on my mind, and so I'm going to shift to our shipbuilding, um, Mr. Secretary. We uh, we're all troubled by the. 75-day uh, shipbuilding review that found major delays among most of the shipbuilding programs. And I was surprised to hear that the Navy estimates that the frigate uh, will be delayed uh, by as many as 36 months. Um, as you and I discussed last year, uh, I worked to secure funding for uh, the industrial base and workforce development programs that would support growing the skilled workforce that we need to sustain robust production of the frigate. Uh, 
I'm disappointed that it took uh, the Navy 15 months to obligate the fiscal year 2023 funds. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, will you uh, explain to the committee the importance of continuing to fully fund the frigate program and its associated workforce development needs on a consistent annual basis? And will you commit to working with me to ensure that the Navy uh, works diligently and responsibly to execute these funds? Uh, as you know, this, this budget request, Senator, does include uh, requests uh, for uh, fully funding the, the FY25 frigate. And, uh, but to your point, in terms of making sure that we have uh, the workforce that can provide the capacity that we need to stay on, on track and, uh, and keep up with the, with the demand, that, that's critical. So the industrial base needs to be able to recruit, not only recruit, but retain the talent that's needed to, to do that. Uh, and we have to continue to invest in that. And, and again, we have to pick up the pace. And so we'll continue to work with uh, industry leaders uh, to do, uh, in, in fact, do that. And I have met with some industry leaders and talked about uh, the, the, you know, what we're doing with the, uh, the resources that are being provided uh, to investing in, in the industrial base. And we'll continue to do that going forward. And I think I think they are doing some things on their own to uh, to invest, uh, but uh, but we have to work together in a more meaningful way to to increase capacity. So. Thank you, thank you, Senator Graham. Thank you. Uh, rather than get in a fight about the Navy, <laughs> why don't we agree with the following: uh, that the Battle Force Ship Assessment Requirement Report uh, issued said that we need 381 man ships. 300 and 134 unmanned for a total fleet size of 515, I think, by 2043. Uh, General Brown, is that right? Uh, Senator, I, I'm not familiar with the complete study, but I, I, do, I do know we need additional uh, okay. capability. I mean, so I'm just assuming the people who issued this knew what they were talking about. <clears throat> we're on track to have 294 ships by 2030 under the budget proposal. Is that right? Uh, um, Secretary Austin? Uh, right, 291, okay. Yep. Okay. 29, and, and... Yeah, right, so we're at 293, and 2030, we're going to have 294. <laughs> there must be a lot of shipbuilding between 30 and 40. The problem's money. It's not your fault. I'm not blaming anybody. I think this committee ought to look at an OCO account, if you believe the Navy is essential to deterring China, that to come up with a sustainable plan to get our Navy in shape to deter war with China and other places. I think we've got to look at sort of modernization OCO. I want to have a bipartisan discussion about to give you the ships and the, the things you need to win the wars we hope we never have to fight by deterring them. Um, so let's go to Ukraine right quick. Uh, General Austin, you said that uh, Ukraine is a vital natural, a national security interest to the United States. How that ends, do you agree? That if we lose in Ukraine, pull the plug on Ukraine, we'll send a signal of weakness. That's, that's right. Yeah. That's right, Senator. I, I agree with that. And General Brown, I'm sure you agree, too. I, I do agree. I totally agree. There are people on our side, Senator Collins will tell you, we hear from all the time, just, you know, it doesn't matter, pull the plug on Ukraine. All due respect, you're wrong, uh, in my view. So I'm going to keep supporting Ukraine. Now, you just confirmed that, there, that, that we're delaying transfer or stopping transfer of certain weapons, like 2,000-pound bombs, to Israel. Is that correct? Uh, what I Secretary said, Elson. we're assessing uh, okay. you know, we're, you know, where okay. we are right now. Well, there are media reports that has happened. Are they incorrect? that we have made a decision to, yeah. again, we've made no decisions, okay. we're assessing. Are you worried that if you make a decision to deny weapons that Israel say they need, uh, that it would send a signal to Hamas and Iran to, we, to keep pushing? Uh, Senator, we want to make sure that we're providing uh, the right kinds of uh, weaponry. Uh, and, okay. Would you have supported dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, General Brown, to end World War II? Well, Senator, I think it's based on the situation where the Well, we know. I mean, it's happened. We know. <laughs> I'm not asking. that They did it. Do you think that was disproportionate? 
It, it was uh, it was definitely. Uh, well, well, do you do you in hindsight do you think that was the right decision for America to drop two atomic bombs on the Japanese cities in question? Well, I'll tell you, it stopped the World War. Okay. Yeah. Well, so we had a. Do you agree, General Austin? If you'd been around, would you say drop them? I yeah you know, I agree with the chairman here. It, I mean I mean if you were if we go back in time says hey we got two atomic bombs should we drop them what would you say? Well you know I think the leadership was interested in in curtailing the. Well what's what's inter, what's Israel interested in? Do you believe Iran really wants to kill all the Jews if they could? They the Iranian say, regime, yeah. They, they, do you believe Hamas is serious when they say we'll keep doing it over and over again? Do you do you agree that they will if they can? I I do. Hamas, okay. Though, but right. Do you believe that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization also bent on the destruction of the Jewish state? Hezbollah is a terrorist terrorist organization. Okay. So Israel's been hit in the last few weeks by Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas, dedicated to their destruction. And you're telling me. You're going to tell them how to fight the war and what they can and can't use when everybody around them wants to kill all the Jews? And you're telling me that if we withhold weapons in this fight, the existential fight for the life of the Jewish state, it won't send the wrong signal? Do you still think it was a good idea, General Austin, to get out of Afghanistan? I support the president. Yeah, I think you do. I think it was a disastrous decision. If we stop weapons necessary to destroy the enemies of the state of Israel at a time of great peril, we will pay a price. This is obscene. It is absurd. Give Israel what they need to fight the war they can't afford to lose. This is Hiroshima and Nagasaki on steroids. Senator Murphy, you're clear. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great to see you both. Thank you for your service to the country. It's pretty stunning to me how this country and our allies fail to learn recent history lessons. Those recent history lessons in both Afghanistan and Iraq tell us that there are substantial grave limitations to the ability of military force to eliminate a terrorist threat. In fact, History tells us that the application of overwhelming military force can, in fact, grow terrorist threats, not shrink them. Mr. Secretary, you've said today that Israel has the right to defend itself. The United States supports Israel's right to defend itself. I agree. But if Israel's strategy is making it more likely, not less likely, that future terrorist attacks will occur, then it is not an effective strategy. And so it's all well and good to get angry about a conversation the United States is having with Israel over the right strategy to defeat terrorism, but we have lots of experience in failed strategies. The National Intelligence Estimate, released just earlier this year, said this, that the Gaza crisis has galvanized violence by a range of actors around the world, and while it is too early to tell, it is likely that the Gaza conflict will have a generational impact on terrorism, a generational impact on terrorism. Both Al-Qaeda and ISIS, inspired by Hamas, have directed supporters to conduct attacks against Israeli and U.S. interests. Here's my question. How do we apply the lessons that we learned in Iraq and Afghanistan as a means of helping Israel understand how to defeat Hamas? And what is your assessment of whether this campaign is in the long run going to decrease the ability of Hamas or follow-on organizations to recruit and retain strength and the ability to hurt Israel and the United States? Thanks, Senator. We've said all along that Hamas does not equal the Palestinian people. Uh, they're, they're not one and the same. And, and uh, what we learned, to, to your point, uh, key lesson there is that you have to protect the people, the civilians in the battle space, otherwise uh, you create more terrorists uh, uh, going forward. Uh, so it's not only uh, a moral imperative, but it's also uh, 
a, a strategic imperative that, uh, that you, you protect civilians. And, so, and, and the two aren't mutually exclusive. You can do both. And, uh, and, 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 and we know how to do that. And so in terms of the lessons learned, the kinds of things that we would endeavor to pass along, those are the things that, uh, that we continue to have a dialogue on. But uh, you know, we, there have been far too many, far too many casual, civilian casualties in this battle space. And, and I, think, uh, I think we should do everything possible uh, to ensure that we, we're protecting for uh, civilians and providing for, for their welfare, uh, humanitarian assistance. So. I think you are right that there is a strategic and a moral reason to care about the number of civilian casualties in Gaza, even if you don't care about the moral consequences of 13,000 children dead, you should care about the strategic consequences of providing continued bulletin board recruiting material to the very organizations that we we're trying to destroy. Um, Mr. Secretary, let me do a hard turn here on a subject really important to U.S. national security, but also to my state. Um, as you know, this budget um, downgrades our commitment to building Virginia class submarines from two to one a year. Um, we made a big mistake in the 1990s when we hollowed out the submarine industrial base. Uh, we went from having 12,000 uh, employees uh, at Electric Boat down to about 1,500, and it took us a decade or more to scale back up when we realized we really needed these submarines. Um, how, how, do, how can we look at the request for only one Virginia-class submarine in FY25 as anything but a pretty enormous step back for our industrial base? I'm really worried about our ability um, to be able to deliver what we know we need, which is two Virginia-class submarines and keeping the Columbia class on time. I just worry that you can't do that uh, if you take this big, even if it's just a one-year, but a big step back in commitment to the Virginia program. Uh, thanks, Senator. So the choices are to uh, increase the backlog by putting uh, more demand on the, on the system or invest more in the industrial base. And that's the approach that we've taken. We asked you for uh, in 23 and 24, we asked you for $1.9 billion uh, to put, uh, to invest in the industrial base, sub-industrial base. Uh, for this budget, we're asking for $4 billion. Uh, the, uh, the supplemental gives us $3.3 billion, and the Australians are also investing in the submarine industrial base, our submarine industrial base. So uh, as I have talked with industry leaders, uh, you know, we have talked about how we go about recruiting uh, more people, increasing strength, uh, in, strength in the supply chains. Uh, and so that work, uh, that work is ongoing and needs to be done. But we have to cre uh, increase the capacity. And I know there's arguments both ways in terms of the demand versus, versus investing in, uh, in the capacity. Uh, but uh, they believe, and, and I believe, that, that we'll get there, uh, but we just need to do more in terms of capacity. So. I appreciate that $4 billion investment. It's significant, but that has to be an immediate pathway to get us back on track to be building those two Virginia classes a year. Look forward to working with you on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hoban. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you believe that Israel has to fully defeat Hamas so that they don't come back and have another attack like October 7th? Uh, it, it's... I do believe that Hamas has to be defeated, yes. Uh, and I, uh, the goal of the Israeli leadership, as, uh, uh, as um, stated by them, is to destroy Hamas. Okay, then if they need to be fully defeated, then won't giving them precision weapons like Boeing's joint attack, direct attack munitions, and small diameter bombs help them fully defeat Hamas without, with, with less uh, collateral damage with less impact on civilians. Those precision weapons will help them fully defeat Hamas with less impact on the civilian population in Gaza. So why wouldn't we go ahead and get them to get them those weapons just as fast as we can? Uh, I tend to agree with you. You need uh, precision guided munitions of the, of the right type. And that's why we uh, just recently provided uh, small, di uh, small diameter bombs to, to Israel. But clearly, it was the intent of Congress to get Israel that assistance, and so we're watching very closely that you get that to them as expeditiously as possible so they can fully defeat Hamas, so Hamas doesn't regenerate and do the same kind of attack that they did on October 7th. Wouldn't you agree with that? I, I would agree with that, and I, I would also agree with the point that we need to do everything we can to 
uh, to protect civilians in the battle space. So that precision that you talked about is really, really important. So some types of munitions are, are better suited than, than others. But, uh, but we really would like to see uh, that, uh, that begin to happen in terms of uh, you know, fewer casualties, fewer civi civilian casualties and more do you, precise. Do you agree or not that we need to get them the assistance to fully defeat Hamas? Do you agree with that or not? And we have been doing that from the very beginning. Do you agree with that or not? I, I do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to talk to you about Sentinel. Uh, given the incredible uh, threat from China and Russia and the incredible buildup we're seeing, particularly in China, with their nuclear arsenal, and given the Nunn McCurdy review, uh, one, are you fully committed to modernization of our nuclear forces to the Sen uh, Sentinel program? And how are you going to do and what are you going to do to keep that on track? Well, as you know, the, uh, our, our nuclear portfolio and our nuclear triad is, uh, is key to our strategic deterrence. And, uh, and so in this budget, there's uh, $49 billion that are, is focused on, uh, on that portfolio. Uh, for Sentinel, uh, there's $3.7 billion. As the Air Force uh, works through its number, Curdy, uh, we want to continue down the path to modernize to, because this uh, leg is uh, this leg of the triad, Sentinel, is the one that's uh, available 24-7. Um, and to provide uh, that strategic deterrence in addition to the other two legs of the, uh, the triad. Are you fully committed to doing what you need to to keep it on track? Uh, I am. And do you feel that you have the plan in place right now to do that? Well, that, this is where the Air Force is working through the, the number, McCurdy, and I've I not gotten a brief from, from uh, them, but I, I do know that the Air Force is, is focused on this you know, based on my past experience and, and based on how important I know it is for, for the nation. Are there... Is there something that you would want to see from this committee that would help you do that? Well, I think the, the, the collaboration with the committee uh, and consistent uh, uh, funding, on-time funding, will be uh, helpful to, to move forward. And then uh, it, just constant dialogue uh, we'll to figure out where we can take out any slack to ensure we get the, uh, the capability. Well, the, uh, our chairman is uh, from Montana, the home of Malmstrom, and, and of course we have the Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota and Senator Barrasso and, uh, in uh, F.E. Warren, I know that we're committed to helping you. So if there's something else that needs to be done, we want to know what it is to keep that program on track. We'll, we'll definitely let you know. Okay, thank you very much. And then the last question I would have, uh, Mr. Chairman, for you is, um, how are you making sure that we have enough ISR re with this, you know, development in for space-based assets? And that's, I know it's critically important. We're very committed to funding that and advancing it. I'm concerned that you're not doing enough to maintain an ISR capacity. What are you doing to make sure that you have the ISR assets that all of the forces, not just Air Force, but all of our forces are asking for? You know, as a, as a joint warfighter, uh, and having been uh, serving jointly, um, I've been focused not just on the Air Force, but all the services. And when I look at the ISR in, in particular, um, it's the capability that not only do we have from the air breathing assets, but it's how we bring in ISR from our our, our, other, our maritime assets, how we bring it in, and particularly from our space assets, and how we transition. Um, I'd also highlight the fact that how cyber plays a key role in, uh, in uh, some of our ISR as well. And so having the capability to bring that uh, uh, all together and using our digital tools to take all the information we get from, from whatever ISR platform, that's what we really, you know, that's the, where the focus is. How do you take that information, the things we can analyze to uh, determine intent, and it's not just, I know our command commands are focused on particular platforms, but it's the combination of platforms and capability and how we bring that together that's going to make us most effective as a joint force. Well, you and I have worked on this for some time, and you've had a good common sense approach to it. Uh, and so we want to continue working with you on it. But what you do in ISR affects every single uh, force in the DOD, not just the Air Force. It's vitally important. So I want to uh, encourage your continued focus on making sure that you have adequate ISR, and we'll work with you to do that. But very important. Actually, having an ISR actually makes my job easier. So uh, I'm, I'm completely focused on ensuring we have that capability. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, th uh, thank you. I, I got a couple more questions, and I thank you guys for your patience and in, in going through the order here. We've had good participation today. Look, I've repeatedly called upon Secretary Mayorkas and uh, President Biden and Congress to step up and fix what's going on in the southern border. It's not sustainable at all, and it's unacceptable. Uh, DHS continues to rely on DOD support uh, at the southern border to make sure that uh, 
they're doing what they can do. Um, but once again, I don't see any funding in this budget for DOD personnel for those operations. So Mr. Secretary, a couple things. Number one, how many troops are serving currently on the southern border? Um, there's about 2,500 on yeah. the border. And how does DOD cover these costs? Uh, as we always have out of our operating budget. Sure. And so uh, what does that mean in operationally? Who gets shorted? Um, of course, that, that means that, that there's something else that we're not doing be because of that support. So, uh, but, but, you know, they, they, it's important that, uh, that we do everything we can to su support DHS in its effort to, uh, in, in its work on the, in the, on the southwest border. Uh, we've been doing that for 19 of the last 23 years. Uh, the, uh, the price tag's been about $4 billion. Uh, but, uh, but again, uh, we are supporting an agency, and, and DHS is a lead agency. And, and again, it's important to our country, and, and we're going to do what so, we are to support. So let, let me ask you this, Mr. Secretary. Do you agree uh, with my perspective that the administration needs to do more to secure the border? and? We shouldn't have to depend upon the military to do that. Um, we, we should or should not. I should not have to depend upon the military I, for that. I could not. I, I agree, but uh, but if we're required to uh, to assist, then certainly we will yeah, continue okay. to do so. I want to go back to and, and the president agrees with uh, the fact that there's more that should be done, and that's why when you came up with this bipartisan approach, yep. uh, that was very much supported. So. Yeah, well, no doubt about it. Uh, Congress dropped the ball on that because that would have changed things dramatically, but some folks wanted to be used as a political tool when, in fact, we ought to be working for the betterment of the country, not for Democrats or Republicans. I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about Sentinel. Senator Hoven brought this up. Um, I'm frustrated. Secretary Kendall is recused himself for reasons, by the way, that I understand members of Congress who've created that problem. Um, Northrop Grumman is doing what they can do. The Air Force is doing what they can do. Bechtel's doing what they can do. You guys have educated me very, very well on what's going on in this world and why this is a dangerous time. Yet I don't get the sense of urgency on Sentinel, particularly with the ground-based missiles that we have. We've got timelines, and quite frankly, we had a we had a, a general in front of um, the, the VA Milcon committee, and, and General Green, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, General Green, and I asked him about timelines. Great guy, incredibly, uh, incredibly talented. Could not even give me the year they anticipated starting this program. And I get it. There's there's studies going on. There's cost issues, and it's going to cost a lot. Uh, General Brown, can, can you give me any sort of, uh, this is in your old job front and center, and it's still in your new job too, by the way, but can you give me any idea on if I should be concerned about the timeline continuing to slip on the ground-based nuclear missile sentinel project that I think is critically important as a deterrent moving forward in this world in the 21st century? Well, Senator, I, I don't necessarily have the details, but I think for, for all of us, we all should be, uh, you know, I, I get concerned we don't get the uh, capability to the hands of our warfighters or things that are very important to our strategic deterrence. And, and so my, my focus as a chairman, um, and, and same as, as when I was the Air Force chief, is to ensure we're doing everything we can to make sure we bring that capability forward. And, and so I am focused and uh, want to make sure that uh, we, we continue that. So I, I do have, uh, like you, have some concerns. I want to understand where we are and what the things we need to do uh, to ensure we bring, uh, bring that capability forward as quickly as possible. We are here to help. Yes, sir. But I will tell you that in, unless we start getting timelines and goals and everything set up, um, there's going to be a lot of pressure being put on people because, quite frankly, I, I do not think um, it's acceptable to be continuing to say, um, don't worry about this, it's coming. Uh, the truth is, is we've been at this for a while, and I haven't seen it coming. Uh, seen it progressing to the, to the point it needs to. Um, uh, 
Senator Collins, I'll get to you. I want to get to Senator Murkowski for her first round. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and apologize. Um, we're all jumping in between multiple appropriations subcommittees this morning. But, gentlemen, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for your leadership. Um, I know that there's probably been a great deal of, of discussion here this morning, as there is just generally about the, uh, the, the threats from, from China, uh, Iran, um, uh, the conflicts in Ukraine. But I feel it's important to always underscore that we never take our eye off of North Korea. We just last month, of course, fired missiles in the direction of Japan, one of our strongest allies in the Pacific. Um, it was Prime Minister uh, Kishida who noted just shortly after the most recent launch from North Korea that their frequent launches, launches threaten the peace and safety of not only Japan but the region and the international security. So I just, I just make this statement to, uh, to let you know that it's something that we're certainly um, uh, engaged in tracking and I know you are as well. Uh, but I want to ask you, Mr. Secretary, uh, not about North Korea, but um, a focus on the Arctic. Your FY25 uh, budget overview states that the goal of this year's budget request is to, quote, develop a monitor and response approach in the Arctic. So I read that to suggest that this is a passive approach in the Arctic, which I think would be a strategic critical air. Um, as you know, we're already behind, we're under-equipped when it comes to, to assets. Uh, when you look at what re Russia has with their icebreaker fleet of about 50 vessels in the United States here, we have barely two. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you've been to the state, you've had really strong statements noting that uh, the United States has to project power in both regions while also serving as a front line in the homeland defense mission. So you're saying all the right things, but I'm concerned about the wording here. And I, I, I would ask for you to just expand on what a monitor and respond approach in the Arctic really entails. Uh, thanks, Senator. Um, United States is an Arctic nation, and uh, and of course, um, this is a strategically important region uh, to us for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and we're going to continue to take actions to prioritize the region. Um, you're going to soon see us release a new Arctic uh, strategy. And that strategy will account for the changes in the environment, you know, the, the, the warming climate, uh, the uh, the fact that we have, uh, you know, new members of NATO that uh, that I think uh, will be very helpful in uh, in working with us going forward. Um, we see each of the military services making uh, investments in uh, in their ability to uh, to operate uh, in uh, uh, in that environment. Um, we also see uh, our combatant commander, uh, Northcom, uh, partnering with uh, with Canada. Uh, to, to modernize uh, uh, NORAD. Uh, and so, um, again, it's important to us. Um, you, you, you know that uh, we conduct some pretty significant exercises like uh, Northern Edge uh, uh, up there. And, and uh, uh, every time we do that, we learn a lot more about ourselves and the challenges that are facing us. Uh, but, uh, but again, the Arctic will remain important to us. In, and uh, will account for that in the, in the uh, new strategy that we're going to release. Well, I thank you for that and, and would suggest uh, also, when, when we factor it into the strategy, that again, when we look at, at the budget, making sure that it is resourced to, uh, to demonstrate that, whether it is in the proper Arctic equipment, um, uh, cold weather service, incentive programs, uh, and the like. Uh, very quickly to you, General Brown. Um, as you well know, Alaska is in a pretty unique position because it executes a NORTHCOM mission, but with PACOM assets, and it creates some operational control issues as NORTHCOM and 11th Air Force commanders are unable to effectively utilize their assets in a, in a timely and efficient manner. Every 11th Air Force commander I've worked with has expressed the concerns about the structure and that it doesn't 
prioritize homeland defense, making their job a little bit more hard, harder. I'm, I'm sure you're tracking this issue. Um, uh, I know that the, the proposal is currently being considered within the Pentagon. I don't know if you have any updates that you can provide now or um, uh, at a later point in time, but it is something that, again, we're looking to, to address. I had a ch conversation with General uh, Guillaume uh, just yesterday. Uh, well, I'm uh, having served as a, a commander of Pacific Air Force. I'm very familiar with the uh, the operational challenges associated with uh, our forces in Alaska that are both uh, uh, focused on NORFCOM, NORAD uh, missions, as well as indo PACOM missions. Uh, I'm not aware of a direct proposal, but I have talked to General Gouet okay. uh, uh, as well, and uh, just based on experience, I know it's something we got to take a look at to continue to make sure that we uh, don't create uh, unnecessary seams to make sure we can uh, respond in whichever way the uh, the nation requires with the capabilities that are stationed there in Alaska. Appreciate your review of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, Congress has overwhelmingly and with bipartisan support indicated its support for providing weapons and other assistance to Israel. These funding bills have passed with 70 to 80 votes in the Senate and by similar bipartisan margins in the House. You said in response to a question today that no final decision has been made. I would suggest to you that pausing or delaying the delivery of weapons to Israel is a decision, and it's a decision that most members of Congress would take issue with. I was reading a report but from John Spencer, who is the chair of Urban War uh, Warfare Studies at West Point. And he said, quote, Israel has implemented more measures to prevent civilian casualties in urban warfare than any other military in the history of war. So that leads me to ask you, what conditions is the administration asking Israel to fulfill before releasing these weapons that the administration has deliberately delayed despite strong congressional support for this assistance? Well, thanks, Senator. Well, first of all, it's, it's about having the right kinds of weapons for the, for the, for the uh, uh, for the task at hand. And a small diameter bomb, which is a precision weapon that's very useful in a, in a dense built-up environment, it's, it, it's helpful. Uh, but maybe not so much a 2,000-pound bomb that, uh, that could create a lot of collateral damage. Uh, and so we've been very clear that, uh, that we have to do more to, uh, or Israel needs to do more to protect the civilians in the battle space. And we wanted to make sure that, uh, that we saw a plan to uh, to move uh, to move those civilians uh, out of out of the battle space uh, before executing any kind of uh, ground combat operation, and 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 we would also like to see them uh, do more precise operations. Now, um, you know, I, I don't doubt that uh, they have uh, some very good policies, uh, and they do. Uh, but it's it's important to make sure that that we're following the policies, and and so we've been having uh, conversations about this. Uh, and uh, and so we think it's imperative that that we do more to protect civilians in the battle space, and that's that's the real issue. So. And I would just suggest to you uh, that it is Hamas that has its military operations under hospitals, under schools, concealed in civilian areas, and is using our hostages, American hostages. Israeli hostages and innocent Palestinian civilians as human shields. I think we need to remember and always remind ourselves that it was Hamas that massacred 1,200 Israelis. It wasn't the Israelis that started this conflict. And I'm just very concerned 
that we not try to micromanage Israel's right to defend itself against a terrorist group backed by Iran. Let me just quickly go to one other issue, um, and that is I know that the national security strategy focuses on great power competition with China. However, the most imminent threat to the U.S. homeland and our citizens abroad, as well as our allies, may well be the reconstituted terrorist factions that have grown since our abandonment of Afghanistan. And to follow up on the chairman's point, according to one DHS official cited in a Washington Post report, more than 10,000 migrants from Central Asian countries have entered into the United States in the past year, some of whom have crossed the border illegally. So is the Department of Defense also keeping its eye on the terrorist threat, which I believe is, as the FBI director has said, blinking red and working with our intelligence community? Uh, absolutely, Senator, we are. Um, you know, I, uh, I meet routinely with uh, director of the CIA and the director of national intelligence and discuss, uh, you know, our, our assets and resources that we have that are focused on collecting on, the, on, on, on these groups. Uh, and I remind you that we were the, we were the, uh, the country that warned both Iran and Russia of uh, a pending attack. And, uh, and so we couldn't do that if we didn't have the visibility uh, that we have. Now, it's not perfect, and we will continue to work to do everything we can to make sure that we have every sensor available uh, helping us here. So. Thank you. Senator Moran. Chairman, Vice Chairman, thank you. Um, General, the Air Force recently awarded a contract uh, for the new survivable Airborne Operations Center, SAOC, to replace the E-4, the Doomsday. Uh, would you, General, highlight for this committee the importance of this aircraft in the event of a national emergency or destruction of ground command and control centers? Well, it's designed to support our nation on our worst day, on a, on a major attack on our, on our nation. And, and so it's very important that it's uh, that not only for the command and control um, and the, for the leadership of the nation, but also for our nuclear command and control as well. So it, it plays a key role to provide the, uh, the president and our national leadership options to uh, continue to uh, operate when we have a, uh, uh, any type of crisis or contingency. What's the reason there needs to be a replacement of the current aircraft? Just uh, based on age. And, and one of the things we have to pay attention to, uh, not only for this particular platform, but for, uh, I would say, all of the platforms we have within the department is to ensure that we actually have a viable platform that uh, we, we can sustain from a maintenance standpoint, because at some point it gets uh, more costly to maintain than to uh, uh, move in, into a new capability. I would also say technology. As technology advances, we want to make sure we have the most advanced capabilities that the nation has to offer in, in the platforms that we use, not only for our command and control, but also for our war fighters. Uh, thank you, General. S Secretary Austin, the uh, Bipartisan Strategic Posture Committee report recommended fully and urgently executing the U.S. nuclear modernization program of record, including the replacement of all delivery systems. Can you highlight, please, some of the key successes related to modernization of our strategic delivery system? Yeah, well, in this forum, I'll, I'll say that, uh, again, we've, uh, we're asking you in this budget for some $49 billion to, uh, to continue in, to invest in all three legs of the triad. Um, we've requested uh, to this point some $149 billion, uh, and, and that money is being put to use to, uh, to upgrade uh, our capabilities uh, across the board. Uh, so as we look at the threat, though, going forward, uh, Senator, Senator Moran, um, you know, the, the threat that we face today is clearly not the threat that we were facing 10 years ago. Uh, and it won't be the same uh, 10 years from now. So this is a kind of a, a changing uh, uh, a challenge. 
and and we have to we have to keep pace with that. And so we we anticipate that going forward there will be more. Uh, uh, Changes that will have to be made, uh, and, you know, as as our adversaries uh, get more capability. So. Thank you, thank you both. I want to thank you for being here, gentlemen. Uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate the testimony you've given here today and the answers to the questions. Senators may submit additional written questions, and we ask you to respond to those questions at a reasonable amount of time. Um, special thank you, even though you didn't say one word, Mike McCord, thank you very, very much. You were a critical part, critical component of making all this stuff work, and I want to recognize your good work. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chairman, and appreciate the opportunity to engage with this uh, subcommittee throughout the year in, in multiple forums. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this subcommittee is going to reconvene on Wednesday, May 15th at 10 a.m. to hear from the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Service Acquisition Executives. As of right now, we stand in recess.